Let's pray together. Thank you, guys. appreciate you very much for that. Heavenly Father, this morning, first of all, we want to thank you for this place and a chance to be together, to worship you corporately, to look into these things as a, as a group, um, to think about these things, not just as a church, but as individuals as well. And we want to thank you that it is the kindness of God that has brought each one of us to repentance, that have come to know you. And we pray that that kindness would be expressed in the way that we interact with each other and not just here in this place, but also in the community, the schools we go to, the places we, uh, we work or, or we serve, all those that we interact with. Lord, that you would make us shining trophies of your kindness. Lord, thank you for all that you've given us. Holy Spirit, we invite you as a gift from God to come and to deal strongly with us. We, uh, I pray that by your choosing, you would come in and deal with the places in our life that we tend to overlook. And that uh, in, the, in the middle of all of this, that Jesus would be exalted and that the Father would be glorified. Most of all, Lord, that the word of God would transform our lives. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a seat. It's good to see you today. Be with you. Appreciate you very much showing up on such a nice day. It's just pretty out. We weren't going to have too many of these, so I'm like you know, trying to hang on to every single one because I know, I mean, I hate to be a pessimist, but, you know, 40 degrees in rain for six months is right around the corner, so get ready. <laughs> But this summer has been a great summer. It's been a, a very different summer. As most of you know, Pastor Joe has been out on well, kind of a medical leave because of uh, some recovery he's doing from a car accident that he was involved with. And he's ex- I know he's excited to be back in October. And uh, I haven't talked to him this week, but um, we're excited to have him back. We're really excited to have him back um, because we miss him. And uh, But... In the meantime, you know, life kind of goes on, and we've been doing good. Things have been going well, and Mike and I are getting a lot better at working together, which is pretty awesome, and, uh, well, I think we are anyway. <laughs> well, that's true, we did, but I mean, you know, we're just, real, we're getting better at depending on each other is what's happening, so he's a good friend. Um, but with this summer, we, we now we have this uh, program, it's called an internship program, and we don't, we don't, um, we don't have it every summer, but um, when there's the opportunity to, we invite someone or some people to be involved, and we encourage them to come and, and, and participate in ministry and stuff with us. And so uh, we, you know, we don't pay them very much. I kind of jokingly said in the earlier services, it's about eight cents an hour. Um, and, but they serve as, as interns here at the church. And what they, what they do is, is, what we look for, I should say, is someone that's about a year removed from high school, right? So maybe after their first year of college or whatever. And generally, we look for someone who's either looking to go into vocational ministry, like pastoral ministry or church ministry of some sort, maybe um, parachurch or even like missions or who, whatever, you know. Or we've kind of broadened the scope. And even somebody who we have just kind of as we pray through it, a, have confidence they're going to be involved in church ministry even as a lay person and we give them an opportunity to kind of see how you know how ministry administration works like coming and being part of staff meetings and being part and we give them like specific assignments things like that um and they you know and they they kind of we we try to help them get some experience in environment in an environment where there's a lot of safety nets so if they mess up it's okay you know it's they, they can fail and not be a failure that sort of thing and so Jonathan Van Vleck was our intern for this summer. Jonathan, why don't you come up here? He, um, he's been working with us since he got done with school. He's been going to Western in uh, Bellingham. And uh, I asked him to come up today and talk to you just because, you know, he was your intern for the summer. He's getting ready to go back to college on the 22nd, I think. And uh, I wanted him to kind of get a chance to share with you what his experience has been. 
and uh, things he liked and hopefully not too many things he didn't like. We'll keep that to the, you know, between us, all right? But no, anyway, I'm just kidding. But anyway, I just wanted him to get a chance to talk to you. So Jonathan, why don't you tell us how things have gone this summer? Yeah, um, so when Danny first came and talked to me about the internship program, possibly doing it, um, it was during spring break, and we were lifting weights, and he's like, hey, Jonathan, have you ever thought about being the intern for the church? And I'm like, ha, ha, that's a good one. I'm thinking this in my mind. I'm like, my whole life has been an internship to this church. Like, I've grown up in this church. I was, I was born in this church, practically. Um, and so I'm thinking in my mind, and I don't want to tell him no, because, you know, he's a pastor, and, you know, you don't just tell your pastor no. I mean, that's just... So what you do is you say, okay, I'll pray about it, yeah. <laughs> um, so I told him that, and so I went back up to school, um, and while I was up at school, um, I got really plugged in with uh, CCF, which is Campus Christian Fellowship. Um, and through that, uh, I guess, group, in my small group up there, um, I kind of did like a 180 kind of on my view of like church life and stuff. Because I had grown up in church, and it kind of just got like uh, the same old, same old type thing, kind of thing you do on Sunday, you just go, you show up and stuff. But up there, I mean, I kind of got, like, totally changed my view. He's like, no, that's not true. Like, church is where, you know, you get together with other believers and you kind of encourage each other and you grow in your walk with God with, in fellowship with other people. Um, and so that's kind of what God changed my view totally on that. And then having Danny come and say, hey, this internship thing, I'm like, oh, maybe I should do this. So I'm like, okay, God, if this is something you want me to do, then that's what I'm going to do. And so did it and made it through that and it, it's been awesome it's just a huge blessing to be able to see um just to work with Danny and just like his like his, I don't know just seeing how wonderful and magnificent he is it's just been like <laughs> just like one of the greatest experiences of my life like I just couldn't be truly blessed no um uh <laughs> yes <laughs> uh, awesome there we go <laughs> but anyways no like and so like one of my favorite things about um this internship um, was being able to go to staff meetings. And so most of what I did, like I've been doing since I was born, but staff meeting, I'd never really been to staff meeting before. Staff meetings are kind of cool, but they're also, I feel like they're long. <laughs> I don't know. But like, anyways, despite whether they're long or not, it doesn't matter. But the coolest thing about staff meetings is just being able to see like the pastors and kind of how hard that they work for our church and stuff. Every single one of those next step cards that you fill out and put in the offering, they pray for each and every single one of those cards. And they divide them up and then they contact people, which is the coolest thing to be able to see, like how hard that they work for us. And those pastors like really do actually care for us. Because, you know, you see them once a week on Sundays and stuff. Like maybe you don't talk to them or something, but staff meetings they're praying for you they're constantly praying for you guys which is super encouraging for me to be able to see um and that's kind of the biggest thing that i really appreciated about this internship was just i don't know being able to see what the pastors really do and kind of what church life is really like so that was my favorite thing uh, jonathan was involved with um children's camp and vbs played major roles in both things give him a hand would you he's Speaking in front of people is one of the things he didn't want to have to do. I told him, you don't really have much of a choice. I'm going to bring you up at least one time. But, uh, yeah, Kids Camp and uh, VBS, lots of other things that we asked him to do. Our family, um, our kind of our, our family fun nights that we do on um, Wednesdays in the summer, um, that ministry, he was super involved with that. And then also he started a young adults group that meets on Saturday nights, and he basically took the full lead on that. And that's kind of what we look to try to do is give, you know, look for where their areas of interest are and then uh, plug them in, give them a chance to, you know, try some things. And, uh, and I'm just really pleased with how he did. It's, it was hard for him. He doesn't know this, but it was harder for him than some of the other students and, and, and interns we've had because with Pastor Joe being gone, I'm spending a lot more time doing other things that normally in the summer I would be able to devote to the interns. And Jonathan is one of those guys that just, you know, you kind of give him like parameters and say, okay, you know, let's do this. And he just goes with it. And, uh, and he won't say no to anything. So if you need your car washed or a couple of quarter wood put back or something, catch him before he leaves. He has a hard time saying no to anybody. And uh, 
And I just love him. I love his family. If you don't know, he's Dick and Terry's son and um, Michael and Barbara Stone's grandson. So he, he's a good, a good kid. It's hard to believe that those guys are finished their freshman year in college. I'm thinking, what in the world? I'm getting old. He's going back. He's heading back on the 22nd. So I'd like to send him back with enough money to buy Top Ramen for at least next semester. So in all seriousness, um, we, we'll take an offering at the end of the service. And if you, uh, you know, just feel led above your regular ties and giving that you would normally do, if you want to, like, help him out or just say thank you to him for a lot of the hard work he did, no kidding, on the eight cents an hour thing. He worked a lot this summer, and we don't really pay very much because we don't want the kids to, to want this internship for the money, and trust me, they don't. Um, but if you want to just say thank you, I'd really appreciate it. I know he would too. Uh, you can just write on your check or on the envelope, you know, in the, in the row there. If you just write intern or Jonathan, we'll make sure he gets that. And that'd be a great way to just send him off to school with a little bit of cash and, uh, more than what I have in my wallet. That's for sure. So, you know, it's interesting. We've been talking about, speaking of going back to school, we've been talking about this whole back to school with James series. And I'm, I'm like, we're going into week two. So if you missed last week, I'll give you just a little bit of catch up, okay? But what, well, one of the things we challenged you to do was to read the book of James all this month. So there's five chapters in the book of James, right? And so Monday through Friday, you just read chapter one on Monday, two on Tuesday, you know, all the way through. And just do that. So most of you should have read at least last week, okay? So you've been through it at least one time. Some of you who are particularly studious, you're working on, you've already done two, you're working on your third. I would encourage you as you're going through the book of James, don't rush through it. Take your time. And maybe as you, you know, okay, so next week I'm going to start over with chapter one. Try a different translation. I'm not talking about like Portuguese or something, you know, but, you know, just try like maybe, and if you do NIV, then maybe switch to NASB or so whatever, you know, the home and Christians or whatever, you know, whatever you'd like. Um, but just try, it's interesting to read scripture that way because you kind of get a little different, it says the same thing, but in a different way. And so it's, it, it's, I really enjoy doing that. Um, so anyway, we've been going through this passage, these passages and kind of thinking about these things. And today we're going to talk about chapter two. I have this love hate relationship with James because he always says things in James that really challenge me if I'll let it. But sometimes I don't let it. You know what I mean? I'll like read through it and just kind of move on. And I don't really try to think about it enough to, to where it can really sink in. So we've kind of been talking about this idea that kind of the subtitle of this is know it, own it, live it, right? And I want to talk a little bit about that. So if you have your listening guide, pull that out. If you don't have a listening guide, maybe just pull out a piece of paper in the pew there. Like there might be an envelope or a next step card. Don't worry. It's okay. It's not sacrilege to use those to take notes on. I do it all the time. And I want you to write those three phrases. Know it, own it, live it. Write one on each line. I didn't place, I didn't, this, Karen went to Denver uh, this week to be with family and watch the, her precious Broncos lose to the Seahawks today. And so I, um, and so I changed things up a little bit. So I'm, I apologize for those notes not being in there. We are recording this, right, Matthew? So she heard me say that. Good. Okay. That's what I wanted. So uh, anyway, but I want to give you like a couple of tips on this, know it, own it, live it, but let's apply it to the verse that we're, uh, we're encouraging. It's kind of our theme verse, and it's the verse we're encouraging you to memorize. So it's James chapter 1, verse 25. Guys, bring it up on the screen, and we'll work through it. Remember, know it, own it, live it, right? So it says, the man, the man who looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues to do this, not forgetting what he has heard, but doing it, He'll be blessed in what he does. Now, who doesn't want that? I want to be blessed in what I do. I'm pretty sure you probably want to be blessed in what you do as well. And so this verse, as I look at it, it's kind of like a, a hit list of things you need to do in order to experience God's blessing in your life. And he talks about three different things, and we've kind of distilled it down to, to know it, own it, live it, right? So when he says, the man who looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom. Now, he's writing this verse. James is writing this passage, this whole this letter to Jews that have been dispersed through the persecution. They've been dispersed, dispersed to all around the Mediterranean, the whole known world. This letter is going out to all kinds of different churches and individuals. They're making copies of it, not on a Xerox machine. They're having to handwrite them, and they're sending them out. It's a, it's, it's a really precious document when it shows up. They're reading it. 
And, and he's, so, but he's not sending it to one church. He's sending it to all the churches. As a matter of fact, if he were alive today, it would, there would be one in our mailbox postmarked to us because this is for us as well as for them in the first century. And he says, the man who looks intently to the perfect law that gives freedom. To a Jew, the law was the Bible. Right? That was, that's when he, whenever the, the, the term the law, the perfect law is mentioned, it's always scripture, right? So he's talking about looking intently into the perfect law. That means know it. It doesn't mean just read it. I asked the kid one day, uh, it was on Wednesday night, how you been doing? Did you read your Bible today? And they were like, uh, I read the cover. Does that count? No, the cover has two words on it, holy Bible. That doesn't count, all right? No, that doesn't count. But doesn't, that's kind of, we can, we can be better than that, right? But have you ever done this? Have you read a passage in Scripture, and then the whole time you were reading that passage, you were thinking about something else? And when you got done reading that passage, you had no idea what you just read or what it was about? I've done, I do that way more often than I'd like to admit. It just, we get, you know, we have to really focus intently. I love that word, looks intently. That's what it means to know it. It's to know what it says, not just read it, know what it says, right? But then the second part, own it, he goes on and he says, and continues to do this. This is the idea that you not only look intently at it, like maybe in the morning when you're doing like your quiet time or whenever you do that, but throughout the day you think about it. Maybe you pull out your Bible if you have it on your phone or, or whatever. It's a little easier to do that. Pull out, but you reread that passage. You read it in a different translation or, or, or you think a little bit differently about it. You do, you, know, you do all of that stuff because you want to continue in it. It's, it's this idea of it making the transition from knowing it here to owning it here. It's about a 15 inch trip from your head to your heart, but sometimes can be really a long journey because it takes a while. So know it, own it, and then live it, of course, he says, not forgetting what he heard, but doing it. We do it. We don't just know it. We don't just own it. We do it. So I want to give you three questions that I think will help you. That's why I had you write, know it, own it, and do it on your page. Next to know it, here's the question. This is the question you want to ask whenever you read any passage. So if you're reading James chapter 1 tomorrow, this is the question you want to ask. You want to ask the question, what does it say? Write that down. What does it say? Just what does it say? I need to know what it says. I need to know what James is trying to say. Next to own it, I want you to write this question. What does it say to me? Because that's the difference between knowing it and knowing it, isn't it? It becomes personal. Like, what is James trying to say to me? Okay? And then the third thing you want to say is, the question you want to ask for live it is, what do I need to do with it? Now, I know you're probably wondering, why is he walking clear over here? It's because Matthew's trying to track me with the camera. And, he's, and I'm making it hard on him. So. And you're writing anyway, so it doesn't really matter. Sorry, Matthew. The way it goes sometimes. What does it say? What does it say to me? And what do I need to do with it? You see, because interpretation, which is understanding scripture, without application is pointless. It's meaningless. There always has to be that application. And so as we look at James, especially in chapter 2, we need to think about what he's trying to say. And how it applies to our life. So I wanna, I'm kind of calling this message exploding the myth of exceptional, acceptable exceptions, right? That's the name of it. There it is. Good job. Thank you. Because I think a lot of times in our life we make exceptions. And we, we're, we make exceptions to truth. We make exceptions to God's law. We make exceptions to God's will for our life. Well, yeah, I know the Bible says this, but... And I'm mostly good, you know, I'm mostly good, I mostly do okay with it, but... And we start making these kind of what, we, what I call acceptable exceptions. Well, in, in almost every situation, but you know, maybe not this one. And so I want to talk about just two of them. I originally had three, but then I thought time wouldn't allow, so I'm going to just talk about two of them. The first one is this, that we become partially impartial, right? So I want to look at this passage in James chapter 2. I want to look at two verses to start with, and then we're going to read the whole passage, verses 2 through 13, so that you can kind of apply the 
know it, own it, live it, principles, those questions to, to, those, to this passage. So let me look at these two verses. It's the first one, chapter 2, verse 1 says, My brothers, as believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ, don't show favoritism. I mean, he just comes right out to it. He says, listen, if you belong to Jesus, don't show favoritism. This is what I love and hate about James. He cuts right to the chase. Love that. You know what I hate? Cuts right to the chase. (laughs) It's like, ugh, ow. Don't show favoritism. And then in verse 9, he kind of sums it all up with a nice bow and says, but if you show favoritism, you sin. You sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. Man, talk about straight to it. And it's at this point in my life when I begin to think, I'm good on this. I'm good on this because I'm not, you know, I don't show favoritism. I really don't. I don't show favoritism. I, I tend to treat everybody about the same. And I really kind of believe that. But the true nature of the sin of this passage is partiality. It's this idea that you give some people a pass and other people not so much. That you're more comfortable in, you know, hanging out with certain people than other people, and it's not for a very good reason. And I'll explain that in a minute. I want to go to verse 2. I want to read through this, and then we're going to kind of, I want to explain to you how God has been dealing with this in my life. Over the past eight months, this passage and I have become very intimately acquainted, and it has been painful for me because God has revealed to me that, that I have not been living up to the standard of Christ in this area of my life, and I thought for a very long time I was. So I want to explain it to you. I want to look at it together as a church and how this verse might, this passage might apply to us as a congregation. So I'll talk about we a lot. But please don't miss that it isn't, just about us as a congregation knowing it and us as a congregation owning it and us as a congregation living it. It's about you. It's about you knowing it and owning it and living it as well. So let's look at this verse together, this passage together, verse 2, and it'll be up on the screen if you need to see it there. Here's what it says. So James is going to tell a little parable. He says, suppose a man comes into your meeting, right, into your church, wearing a gold ring and fine clothes. And a poor man in shabby clothes also comes in. So you see the picture, right? And you probably already know where this is going. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, here, have, there's a seat for you. But say to the poor man, you stand over there. Or you sit on the floor by my feet. Have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Now, I want to pause there for a second and explain kind of the scene that James is describing here. He's, remember, he's writing this to all the churches. So there's a reason he's writing this. It's because they're doing this. They are showing discrimination. They're showing, they're showing favoritism to certain groups, and they're, and they're showing partiality to certain groups, which means they're, 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 being, you know, they're, show, they're discriminating against other groups. In that day, the synagogues, the churches where they met, right, didn't have very many chairs. As a matter of fact, most of them were pretty much without seats at all. They would have some seats along the outside wall and a few, very few, in the middle. Like, we have a seat for everybody, right? And some of you have your seat. I mean, you have your seat. And I know what your seat is because I see you sitting in your seat. Sunday after Sunday after Sunday. It's like if I, I could, like... You could blindfold me and say, hey, where is, where is Michael Wallace today? And I'd be like, right over there. Because that's where Michael sits, close to the door. I think if, you know, it's like the quick escape, right? <laughs> Carol, right up front, keeping me in line. I mean, you know, I know where you guys, this is your seat. And what's interesting to me is when you think about your seats, where you sit, not only do I know where you're going to be, But I wonder to myself, what would happen if somebody else sat in your seat? If you came into church one day and somebody else was in your seat. Now, I know what you would do because you're very, you know, proper people. You'd be like, okay with it. You'd be like, oh, it's no big deal. I'll just move over one seat or move back a row or whatever. But what would you be thinking in your heart? Because that matters. It really does. So when he's talking about it, he's talking about this idea 
that, you know, there were very few seats. And so usually the people who got to sit, it was kind of this thing, you know, like first class on an airplane. It was kind of like that. And all of the riffraff, all the ordinary people, all of the non-important folks, they would stand along the walls or they would sit on the floor. He goes on and says, listen, my dear brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom that he promised to those who love him? But you have insulted the poor. He goes on and says, is it not the rich who are exploiting you? Are they not the ones who are dragging you into court? Are they not the ones who are slandering the noble name of him to whom you belong? If you really keep the, loyal law, the royal law found in Scripture that says, love your neighbor as yourself, you're doing right. But if you show favoritism, listen to this, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. Gives an example. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not commit murder. So if you don't commit adultery, but you commit murder, you have become a lawbreaker. He finishes up by saying this. Speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom. Because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. So I'm reading this and I'm thinking, and this is kind of in some ways, I understand this was written to some churches and things that were going on in that day. But I'm thinking, you know, when it comes to poor people, we, we do pretty good around here, right? Like, because we're not a very affluent community anyway. I don't see a whole lot of, like, you know, $60,000 sports cars in the parking lot this morning, right? And so it's pretty easy for me to, you know, to show, not to, to show you know, uh, impartiality to people based on their financial status, right? I don't have a problem with poor people. It helps being a poor person, right? And I was poor in college. And I mean, if you look at the cars that I drive, you know I'm not, you know, I'm not a particularly wealthy guy. And so it's easy for me. If you're not, if you're not poor, if you're poor, it's easy for you to, you know, to be good with poor people. Or if your family is poor, if you have friends that are poor, we get used to that. And when you live in and worship in South Lewis County, there's a lot of poor people. So it's so but the question I would ask you is this, not so much financially poor. Think about ways that, other ways that people are poor. People who are poor in reputation. Right? Who struggle with things that are not so socially acceptable. And we all struggle, right? But... How about those people that struggle with things that are not so socially acceptable? How about people who disagree with you, who see things from a different perspective than you do? How about people who have a different political slant than you do? How about people who struggle with, with things like gender identification or, 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 or uh, you know, um, sexual identity or whatever. How about people that struggle with, how about just people that just don't agree with you on simple things, complicated things, important things? You know, ask yourself this question. You want to know who's poor? Ask yourself this question. In your mind, in your heart, you want to know who's poor? Ask yourself, who would you be very uncomfortable sitting next to if they showed up at church? I've heard people say, you know, I just don't know if I could sit next to this person if they came to church. I just don't know if I could. This is what he's talking about. This is what he's talking about. You show favoritism because they're rich. What does that mean? They're like you, or they're like you want to be. And those poor people that maybe don't act like you do, don't dress like you do, have different priorities than you do. They get the other side of favoritism. And we think, you know, we're doing pretty good. And i got to be honest with you now. 
for me, I've read this passage over and over again. I think to myself, I'm doing pretty good. And then God says to me, are you really, Danny? Are you really? You see, because on the surface, I am. But when you scratch down past the veneer, when you scratch down to the heart place, that place where I live, where only God and I really know what's truly going on, he made it really clear to me that I'm not doing so good. And the kindness of God brought me to repentance and continues to do so. There's a, Jesus talked about this in Mark chapter 12. He's talking about these religious guys like me. As he taught, Mark 12, this is verses 38 and 39, he says, As he taught, Jesus said, watch out for the teachers of the law. They like to walk around in flowing robes and be greeted in the marketplaces and have, listen to this, the most important seats in the synagogues and the places of honor at banquets. They like to be shown favoritism. And God said, Danny, this is you. This is you. Jesus tells a story in Luke chapter 10. It's a story you've heard before. I'm going to read it to you, but you'll, you'll recognize it. He was talking to one of these teachers of the law, and they'd asked him, you know, what's the most important commandment? He had mentioned that love the Lord your God, but also love your neighbor as yourself, right? And so then he was trying to justify himself because he's wanted to, like, who qualifies as my neighbor? Like, who qualifies as my neighbor? Right? I mean, I need to know because I obviously want to love my neighbor as myself, but is everybody my, I mean, you know, who qualifies? So Jesus answers the question by telling a story and asking a question. The story goes like this. A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, a pretty dangerous road. And when he fell, he fell into the hands of robbers and they stripped him of his clothes and they beat him and then went away, leaving him half dead. So you see the scene. And a priest happened to be going down the same road. And when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. In other words, not only did he just walk by the guy, but he walked as far around him as he could to avoid the man. Jesus goes on. He says, so too a Levite, that would be, you know, someone who's kind of a keeper of the law, also religious, but more political. So too a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, he passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, oh, and I just know this guy's thinking it had to be a Samaritan. Because for Jews, Samaritans were like despised. They were like people that you just, you know, they had no credentials at all. They were kind of half-breeds, and they were politically, you know, on the wrong side of everything. And for a Jew to go from the northern king to the southern kingdom or vice versa, they would literally, if you were a good Jew, would walk all the way around Samaria to avoid even having to put your feet on Samaritan ground. That was how much they despised Samaritans. And so when Jesus said, but a Samaritan, I guarantee this Jewish boy's like, oh, great. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came to where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him, and he bandaged his wounds, poured on oil and wine. And then he put the man on his own donkey and took him to an inn and took care of him. Goes on and says, even the next day, he took out two silver coins and gave them to the innkeeper and said, look after him. And when I return, I'll reimburse you for any extra expense you have. Now Jesus asks the question. So there's the story. Like it, don't like it, doesn't matter. Here's the question. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell in the hands of the robbers? Well, now you have this Jewish religious guy who walked as far away from him as possible. You have this Jewish kind of political slash religious guy who walked as far away from him as possible. And you have a Samaritan that actually, you know, took care of him. It's a, it's a ridiculous question. But listen to the answer. It's equally ridiculous. The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. In the English, that's six words. 
when he could have said exactly the same thing by saying one word, Samaritan. But he wouldn't, or he didn't. Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. And it's hard because in your heart you want to believe, you know, I don't show favoritism. I'm a good guy. I'm the pastor. I've been here for a long time. And God starts scratching past that veneer. And you start thinking about the kinds of people. When they show up at church, you're like, you know, I know how to do it with the flowing robe thing. I know how to shake their hand and smile and say, I'm so glad you're here. When deep down inside, I'm hoping they sit towards the back so less people maybe notice them. And I hope that maybe they, you know, don't stick around after the service too long. And I don't want to have to explain to a lot of people why they were here in the first place. And God begins to break down this myth that it's okay to have some acceptable exceptions to the no favoritism law. And it's the kindness of God. It brings me to repentance. Paul wrote to the church in Philippi, and he said something that I make all the teenagers memorize at least a couple of times in the six years that are in the youth group. And this is what it says. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others as better than yourselves. If you have a problem with better in there, I understand. It's an NIV translation. How about this one, the NASB, more important than yourself? Oh, you're poor. Oh, you're socially unacceptable. Oh, your sin is not, you know, you sit at my feet. You can go stand over against the wall. And yet Paul says, no, 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 no. They're better than you. You let them sit in your seat. They're more important than you. You know, it's so funny. I think a lot of Christians feel like in the church that they attend, they wish that their church was full of just awesome, God-fearing people. You know what I'm saying? Like people that just love Jesus and praise Jesus and, you know, vote Republican. You know what I'm saying? All those things. But that's a little bit like... and. I was just kidding about the vote Republican thing, sorry. But that's a little bit like saying, I want to build a hospital, but only invite healthy people. Right? I mean, I get it. Seems like it would, life would be a lot easier on all the doctors and nurses if the only people who showed up at the hospital were healthy people. But that's not what hospitals are built for. And that's not what churches are built for. And God was really hammering me about this. Saying, Danny, you're a good guy. But this is one area where you're not doing so great. Stop pretending that you can be partially impartial. So the second part of this passage, and I'll wrap it up with this. The second myth is that we could be just factually faithful. And, and you got to understand, the book of James is a letter. So it wasn't divided into chapters and verses. It was just written, and it was given to the churches, right? And so here's James, and he's, and he's, he, and he's not like, you know, we read it in chapters, and it's good that it's in chapters and verses because it makes it easier for us to study and to, and to break it down and think about. But the, the hazard of that is that we start breaking it apart, and a lot of people will take the first 13 verses and separate it from 14 through the rest of the chapter. But understand that after verse 13, when he's talking about not showing partiality and how it's a sin and you're a lawbreaker, if you show partiality towards anyone, whether they're rich or whether they're, you know, Whatever they are, whatever you feel partial towards, if you show partiality towards someone, you're a sin, you, you're, you, you sin and you're a lawbreaker. And then listen to what he says in verse 14, the very next verse. He talks about this idea that you can be factually faithful. And it's just not true. It's a myth. You cannot be factually faithful. Here's what it says. What good is it, my brothers, if a man claims to have faith but has no deeds? 
Can such faith save him? Now, this is an important question because, you know, as a, as a Christian, as I read the Bible, it's very clear to me that your deeds don't save you, right? That, that, that salvation is a gift of God, that comes straight from God, lest no man could boast, right? The idea behind it is, is that all right, my salvation is bought and paid for by the blood of Jesus. I, I, won't, I can never earn it. I don't deserve it. It is a righteousness that is imputed to me. This idea of imputed righteousness is the picture. Like, imagine you went to the bank tomorrow. Just, I don't know, check your balance, whatever. You show up, and the teller says, oh, by the way, there's an extra $1,000 in your account. Now, wouldn't that be nice? doesn't work for me that way. It's usually the other way around. And so you look at the teller, and you say, wait a minute. What, the extra $1,000, what's that about? Somebody stopped by and just decided to put $1,000 in your account. Well, why? No reason why. That's what imputed righteousness is. It's something you didn't earn and you don't deserve. And so when he says, what good is it, my brothers, if a man claims to have faith but has no deeds, can such faith claim him? He's not talking about earning your salvation. What he's talking about is the evidence of your salvation is these good deeds, right? That's the evidence of your salvation. So the question I have for you is, what do you think? Well, he answers, doesn't he? the end of the chapter in verse 26 he says as the body without the spirit is dead so faith without deeds is dead it's this idea that when it can he's talking about partiality in the first half of this chapter so that's only one area but in that area ask yourself the question do your deeds match up with the salvation you claim matthew chapter 7 jesus says this not everyone who says to me lord lord will enter the kingdom of heaven now, that's interesting. Lord literally means boss. Not, anyone, not, ever, not, not everyone who says to me, boss, boss, you know, like you're my boss, twice over, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Listen to what he says. Jesus says, but only he who does the will of my Father who's in heaven. And James would say, and the will of his Father who is in heaven is that you not show partiality. You see, too often our faith, we, we believe the myth that we can have factual faith, that if we just believe enough things about God, that that gives us faith in God, and it's not true. Faith is all about surrender. And love for Jesus is always equated with obedience to Jesus. A little earlier in that same book of Matthew, Jesus is during his famous Sermon on the Mount, the first part of it, he says, I tell you that unless your, this is Matthew 5.20, for I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not inherit the kingdom of heaven. And what he was saying is, is they have this factual faith. They believe some things about God, but they've never surrendered their lives to God. And the way I know they've never surrendered their lives to God is that their deeds do not play that out. The way that they treat other people, remember the long flowing robes and loving the important places in the synagogue and at banquets? Selfish, self-focused. In Galatians, Paul's writing to a church. The Galatian church is a good church, but they were struggling with this idea of showing partiality. You know, there's Jews and Gentiles, right? And for a Jewish male, the distinguishing factor is circumcision. And this church, there were a bunch of folks that were coming in and embracing faith in Jesus. And the church was trying, was kind of arguing about whether or not they needed to, you know, also be circumcised to, you know, to fulfill that part of the law. Now, if you don't know what circumcision is, you should talk to your mom. I'm not going to explain that. But the point is, is that there was this outward expression of Jewish faith, and they were trying to decide if they should. And so th this is what Paul writes. Listen to this, because I want to tell you, he's writing to the, you know, to the Jewish folks in this church. And you've got to remember, the Jewish people were God's chosen people, Remember? I have, I have chosen, he's talking to Moses, I have chosen this people, they are people that will be after my name, I'm, you know, this is my chosen people, right? And so listen to what Paul says. For in Christ Jesus, 
Neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. Do you know what that must I mean, that was not going to be received well by Jews. Like, wait a second. Wait, 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 what? You're putting us, the Jews, God's chosen people, on equal ground in Christ with these uncircumcised Gentiles? That's exactly what he's doing. And a little farther down in Galatians 5.13, he says this, You, my brothers, were called to be free. He's talking to the Jews now, right? Paul was a Jew. You, my brothers, you were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the sinful nature. Rather, listen to this, serve one another in love. Your factual faith won't get you anything. But when you take the faith that you say you have and you apply it to your everyday interactions with people, especially Samaritans, especially the poor, especially those that our culture finds unacceptable, that's when you know that you're living out your faith and you're honoring Christ. And so for me and for us, the question remains, who's the poor person? Who is that person in your life that type of person that whatever. Who is the person in your life that you struggle? To show impartiality towards. Who is that person that you would be like, I wouldn't want to sit next to them in church. That would make me uncomfortable. Will you today allow the kindness of God to bring you to repentance so that he can begin to do a work in your life and make you more like Jesus, make you more like his son. Look at, will you allow the Holy Spirit to do that? Don't allow me to do it. Don't allow your spouse to do it. Don't, I mean, will you invite the Holy Spirit to search you and test you and see if there's any wicked way in you? Would you be willing to do that? There's a next step card in your seat in front of you. And I just gave you two things this week. Make it as easy as I can. There's a place on the front you can write your name. Love it if you do that. We'll pray for you. There's also a place on the back where you can write any prayer requests you might have. Mike's going to come and play a response song. And you can fill that out. There's a couple of like maybe just to help you. Like here's Danny. This is what God has said to me today. I, I, I need to repent of the sin of being only partially impartial. Like, I'm pretty good with some people, but there is that one type of person, that one person that I just, ugh, I need you to pray for me because I really need to repent of, 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 of showing favoritism against that type of person or towards this other. You don't have to go into details. Just check the box. It's real simple. And the second one is, uh, Danny, pray for me as I repent of the sin of being only factually faithful. In other words, I say, oh, I agree with everything you're saying, I, I, not because you said it, but because the Bible teaches it, and I believe it's true, but the problem is I have a really hard time living it out. And I need my faith that, that, I, that, that I claim to be lived out in the life that I live. I need to not just know it and own it, but I need to live it. You check that box if that's you.